Are you aware that this video marks the second installment in an expansive series I'm creating dedicated to my all-time favorite horror franchise? By clicking the link in the description, you'll be taken to the video where I delve into the world of Resident Evil 1 through 3. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, as I will be making many more videos like this. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Resident Evil Code Veronica. Following the resounding success of Resident Evil 2, the genesis of Resident Evil Code Veronica can be traced back to an at the time ambitious but ultimately unsuccessful endeavor to port Resident Evil 2 to the Sega Saturn. The Saturn's limited hardware capacity made it apparent that attempting such a port would result in substantial sacrifice in quality. Shinji Mikami, who at this point was the producer of the Resident Evil franchise, requested more time to perfect the Saturn port of Resident Evil 2. However, he received wise counsel urging him to shift his focus to Sega's upcoming console instead, the Sega Dreamcast, which promised superior technical capabilities in line with Capcom standards. The announcement of Resident Evil Code Veronica came in August of 1998, and its development ran concurrently with that of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, with a grand ambition of positioning it as a true sequel to Resident Evil 2. Nevertheless, due to exclusive agreements Capcom had with PlayStation, Code Veronica was designated as a spin-off, while Resident Evil 3 Nemesis claimed the mantle of the mainline sequel to the second installment. Code Veronica featured the Redfield siblings, Claire and Chris, protagonists from Resident Evil 2 and 1, and adopted a stylistic approach different from its predecessors. It ventured into the realm of European Gothic horror, a departure from the more American horror film influences seen in previous titles resembling the likes of Night of the Living Dead. In a notable shift, Code Veronica embraced real-time 3D environments, forsaking the pre-rendered backgrounds of its predecessors. At some point, Shinji Mikami candidly described Code Veronica as achieving 50 to 60% of his ideal vision for Resident Evil, a sentiment to be respected given his status as the franchise's founding figure. I feel compelled to address this intriguing phenomenon because, somewhat perplexingly, the overall assessment of Resident Evil Code Veronica appears to be divided. It hovers between being hailed as one of the finest entries in the Resident Evil franchise, and simultaneously is branded as one of the weakest among the classic titles. Personally, I find myself in a staunch disagreement with the latter perspective, as Resident Evil Code Veronica undeniably secures a spot within my personal top 5 Resident Evil games. As this video unfolds, I aim to explain why those who perceive this game negatively are, in my opinion, stupid. My personal history with this title spans a relatively brief period. I don't have a deep-seated childhood connection with this game. I can recollect first trying it out towards the end of the PlayStation 2's life cycle, only to find myself struggling to make significant progress. It wasn't until later, when I acquired the HD port for the Xbox 360, that I finally managed to beat it. I share this because my attachment to this title isn't fueled by nostalgia. I didn't fully immerse myself into this game until my teenage years. Nonetheless, it has persevered as one of my favorite Resident Evil titles. With that context in mind, let's dive into it. I'm playing Resident Evil Code Veronica on my PC through the PCS X2 emulator, utilizing the texture upscaling provided by S1 NKO. Additionally, I have applied a widescreen hack to the game which extends the display beyond its original dimensions. Consequently, you may notice a few textures failing to load correctly, as the game wasn't initially designed for such a widescreen mode. After that intense opening title cutscene, the game presents us with a choice to either continue from a saved game or start a new game. Notably, this time around, there's no menu for selecting a different difficulty. There's only one way to experience the game. Resident Evil. The American Midwestern town, Raccoon City, has been completely decimated due to the T-Virus outbreak that was instigated by the international corporation Umbrella. Claire Redfield, who arrived in Raccoon City to search for her lost brother Chris and a rookie police officer, Leon S. Kennedy, managed to escape from the city. 
but their ordeal was only a prelude of things to come. Three months later. Your identification number is WKD4496. <sighs> Welcome to your new home. Her name is Claire Redfield. We caught her trespassing in our Paris lab facility 10 days ago. She apparently infiltrated the complex looking for her lost brother, Chris Redfield, one of the surviving members of RPD's famous STARS teams. Go on, get out of here. This place is finished. I don't know, it might have been a special forces team. But in any case, this prison's been taken over. The troops have been wiped out. What are you saying? You're free to leave the complex. But you may as well know, you have no chance of getting off this island. And what about you? What are you going to do? Don't worry about me. 
a display of generosity, it seems we've been granted our freedom. Armed with nothing but a knife, we venture beyond the confines of the jail, making our way through the corridor and ascending the stairs. The T-Virus has infiltrated the Umbrella prison camp on Rockfort Island, and we find ourselves besieged by a horde of zombies. Swiftly maneuvering past this grim threat, we enter another courtyard where we go to grab a handgun resting on the ground. about that little misunderstanding, but I thought you were another one of those monsters. Shut up. Make one wrong move and I'll shoot. Relax, beautiful. I said I was sorry. My name's Steve. I was a prisoner on this island. And I'm guessing you're not from Umbrella either. No, I'm Claire. Claire Redfield. Claire? Hmm. Nice. I'll remember that. Hey, I heard there's an airport around here. But once I find it, I can finally escape from this crazy island. Well, I'll see ya. Hey, wait up! I don't want you following me, lady. You'll only slow me down. Steve tends to be a point of contention for many players, contributing to their unfavorable perception of the game. However, I hold a different view. Sure, his voice acting can be somewhat cringeworthy and his behavior occasionally grating. I don't want you following me, lady. You'll only slow me down. I genuinely appreciate Steve as a character. As our journey in this game unfolds, we'll delve deeper into my reasons behind this sentiment. For the time being, we press onward into yet another courtyard, leading us to what appears to be a dormitory of some sort. Within its dimly lit confines, we encounter more of the undead. Pushing forward and entering one of the doors, we arrive in a bunk room. Amidst the bunk beds, we discover the prisoner's diary. In the pages of the prisoner's diary, we learn that the island where we find ourselves is situated somewhere south of the equator. Shedding some light on our remote location. The diary also delves into the life of one of the writer's bunkmates, a man named Bob. It seems that Bob had served as an attendant to Alfred, the head of the island, and found himself confined to the prison camp due to a minor error or oversight. Amid the chaotic surroundings, our attention is drawn to a shelf adorned with handgun bullets. As we reach out to claim them, a sudden onslaught of the undead comes to overwhelm us. Despite the harrowing ambush, we managed to secure the two Calico M100Ps, an interesting discovery, 
especially given the history that these firearms were originally intended for Resident Evil 2, but were ultimately left on the cutting room floor. Exiting the dormitory, we dash through the narrow back alley. Here, a cage stands in stark contrast to a nearby building. Without hesitation, we rush into the building only to encounter a security checkpoint. Please deposit any metallic items you have in the security box. As a requirement, we're told to deposit all our metallic possessions into the security box. Following this, we continue down the corridor, eventually arriving in a room resembling a crafts or workshop space. Laying before us on the table, we discover a user's manual that provides a concise tutorial on the operation of the 3D duplicator, conveniently situated to our right. In essence, it explains that the process is straightforward. You place an item you desire to duplicate into the machine, select the material from which the item will be crafted, and the machine will proceed to create a duplicate of the chosen object. Moving into an adjacent room, our eyes fall upon yet another document. This time it's a fax regarding the facility access application. The fax delves into the particulars of a visitor on the island, tasked with transporting a novel, non-metallic material identified as TG-01. How convenient. Chris Redfield. What are you doing here? Chris Redfield. Is he a relative of yours or something? You mean my brother? Ah. Your siblings. Well, it seems your brother is under surveillance by Umbrella. What? I've got to contact Leon and tell him to let my brother know he's being monitored. It's a good thing I have access to an outside connection from here. Well, that file shows the latitude and longitude of this place. <laughs> Why don't you send your brother the coordinates and ask him to come help? Thanks. I'll do that. Hey. I was just kidding. There's no way he could get here, even if he is your brother. Yes, he can. I'm sure of it. No way. He won't come. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. Believe me, I know. What was that all about? On one of the room's walls, we locate a lever designed for a lock release mechanism. We pull it and, as we investigate further, we stumble upon the Hawk emblem located in a drawer. Though it doesn't help too much as we realize we can't carry it along due to the restrictions at the checkpoint that forbid us from holding any metallic items. Due to this limitation, we swiftly exit the room and retrace our steps. Just beyond the door, we approach the shutter and press the switch. As the shutter ascends, we are ambushed once again. We grab the fire extinguisher on the ground. Nearby, in the cage, we find an ominous looking guillotine, alluded to in the prisoner's diary. It is here we grab a padlock key. Our progress back to the main courtyard is suddenly disrupted by a surprise attack from a pack of Cerberus dogs. We use the padlock key to unlock the gate, which reveals a shortcut leading us back to the security checkpoint. Back in the Eerie Cemetery, we put the fire extinguisher to good use. With the truck now accessible, we retrieve a conspicuous briefcase and decide to investigate its contents. We find the TG-01 material concealed within the briefcase. With the TG-01 material in our possession, we make our way back through the security checkpoint to utilize it with the item duplicator. Following the procedure, we craft a brand new Hawk emblem from the TG-01 material. With this emblem in hand, we proceed to the imposing door where our paths first cross with Steve. Placing the emblem into the lock, the door opens, granting us passage and facilitating our escape from the prison area. 
This path leads us to a large bridge that bears the signs of significant damage, with a section having collapsed in the center. We utilize the metal box and add it to the others, effectively crafting a makeshift pathway to help us in our ascent over the fire. This allows us to advance further, and we proceed up the stairs. Having successfully gone up the stairs and passed through the relentless undead, we find ourselves in yet another courtyard. Swiftly eliminating the dogs, we take a conspicuous item resting on the ground, a plaque with the title Navy Proof. As we step inside the main hall, a haunting tune reminiscent of past entries in the series envelops us. Serving as a nod to the franchise's history, climbing the stairs, we make our way to the first safe room. Inside, we come upon a note, written by the secretary, providing insights into the life of Alfred, the overseer of this place. The note conveys the secretary's frustration over Alfred's persistent paranoia and how it affects their daily dealings. It also alludes to a private residence situated atop the hill behind the main building, where Alfred resides reportedly alongside his sister, Alexia. The secretary appeared to be treading on delicate ground when it came to Alfred's sister, as he became enraged at her mention. She felt it wise to not discuss her any further. In the corner of the room, our attention is drawn to a door featuring two weapon imprints, which appears firmly locked. Undeterred, we push a dresser and locate an ID card that was concealed beneath it. A closer examination of the ID card reveals a code on the back. With this newfound information, we proceed to use this card in conjunction with the computer stationed at the front desk. Using the code on the back of the card, we release the electronic lock. The previously locked door at the back of the hall is now open. Navigating through the corridor where the undead remain a constant threat, we arrive at a peculiar model room. Prominently displayed on the wall is a decorative ant figurine, and beneath it, a blue button. With a sense of curiosity, we press the button. Within this chamber, we grab a wheel lying on the floor, and then reach for the two handguns mounted on the wall. However, our attempts to claim these weapons are quickly thwarted, as the path shuts, trapping us compelling us to return the weapons to their original positions, opening the path once again and allowing us to leave. Hurrying back to the main hall, we're startled to discover that Steve, too, has found himself ensnared by the same peculiar trap. Yeah! Help me! Steve? It seems it never dawned on him to just put the guns back, but we press on anyway. Pressing the two gun pictures effectively releases Steve from this predicament. Huh. Huh. That was too close. But I found something, thanks to you. Looks cool, huh? Oh, I need those. Give them to me. You gotta be kidding. I found it, and I'm keeping it. Fine. Let's make a deal. I'll trade you for something fully automatic. See you around, Claire. Adios. Hey, wait! Steve!
Yet, much to our frustration, Steve proves to be quite uncooperative, insisting he won't give us any guns until we get him an automatic weapon instead. We make our way back to the main hall. Redfield! How dare you interfere with my operation? What are you talking about? You let yourself be captured so you could lead your people to this base! I have no idea what you're babbling about. You don't fool me. I am Alfred Ashford, commander of this base. Oh? You must be one of Umbrella's lower level officers if you're in command of a backwater base like this one. How dare you! The Ashford family is among the world's first and finest. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella Inc. Now tell me, why have you attacked this installation? Attacked? Shortly after you arrived, my base was attacked. You must have informed your people of its location. I still don't follow you. I really don't know anything about that. Unacceptable! How can you deny it? My base has been destroyed. And thanks to you, the experimental T-Virus was released, creating countless zombies and monsters. Tell me, who do you work for? Who sent you? <laughs> Have it your way, then. You're just a rat in a cage anyway. I'll be sure to keep you entertained before I dispose of you. <laughs> Carrying the steering wheel to a nearby waterway, we insert it into the platform mechanism, unveiling a submerged submarine. Going inside, we first grab a side pack located on one of the sub seats, giving us two more item slots. We then proceed to operate the console, descending further into the underwater facility. Within the depths of the submerged complex, we navigate through the corridors and enter a room where a plane can be seen inside the confines of this cave. Crossing the bridge, we access another room, where an elevator takes us upward to the second floor. Upon re-emerging into the cave, we notice it is possible to raise the bridge, though at this time we lack the lever necessary to do so. Using the crane controls, we maneuver the box, granting us access to the console position just behind it. box here we find the biohazard card as well as some bowgun arrows after the elevator has been raised. We backtrack across the bridge and explore an alternate door on the opposite side of the room. Located near the entrance of the plane, we press a button bringing the platform nearer. We see three indentations in the console, shaped to accommodate the plaque we obtained earlier. We leave the underwater facility and retrace our steps back to the location where we first crossed the bridge. This time we opt to enter a door situated next to this gate here, which leads us into the training facility. Upon entering the courtyard, we face an unexpected counter with a boss, uh, sort of. <laughs> Reminiscent of Earthworm Jim here from RE3, he takes us by surprise. 
but I decide to evade the threat and make our way into the training facility instead. Ascending the stairs, we encounter two doors. One of them is lacking a doorknob, leaving us with no alternative but to enter the other. Inside, we discover what appears to be a laboratory, where a bow gun is placed on a table. Adjacent to the weapon, a memo divulges the existence of a pass number required to access the lab's locked room. The memo seems to be a reminder for an absent-minded lab assistant who struggles to recall the four-digit passcode. However, there's a picture of a red skeleton in the lab that holds the essential code. Regrettably, the image appears to be indecipherable from our current vantage point, compelling us to explore the other means of gaining this clearer view. Venturing into another room that appears to serve as a security office, we dispatch of the undead inhabitants and we discover a map conveniently resting on the fax machine. In the back of the room we find a storage locker that is currently locked. At this time we don't have the key item in order to unlock this, so we move on. Entering into a locker room that connects with a pool and sauna, we find another thing. Within the pool we locate a key adorned with a distinctive tag. Carrying this key back to the security room and using it on the locked locker that we found earlier, we uncover a cache of bowgun powder. This enables us to craft explosive bolts for the bowgun. Using the biohazard card next to the shutter in the hallway, we successfully unlock and raise it, granting us access to whatever lies beyond. Evading Alfred's barrage of bullets, we pursue him, ascending up the stairs and re-entering the upper floor of the training facility. In the safe room adjacent to the vending machines, we discover some green herbs and a hemostatic medicine resting on the couch. These can be given to Rodrigo, the guy who came to our aid at the beginning of the game. <laughs> Consider the area you are in a special playground I have prepared just for you. Please try and keep me amused, and do not disappoint me by dying too soon. I so want to enjoy this. <laughs> I really do enjoy Peter Oldring's brave interpretation of Alfred's character. Moving into the next room, we stumble upon two submachine guns. These are the automatic weapons we can trade with Steve in exchange for the gold Lugers, which, as we know, can be used to unlock the door in the main building. Although the submachine guns are currently empty, we can see a magazine on the crates just below. This is the Bandersnatch, a unique and troublesome enemy in the Resident Evil universe. While they might not pose an extreme threat, their ability to stun lock can become bad fast, particularly if you've chosen a weapon that lacks the means to effectively stun lock them instead.
Oh yeah, that felt good. Don't worry, Claire. Your knight in shining armor is here. You wish. But thanks for the help. See? This is why you need me. I got your back. Whatever. Here. Take these. Machine guns? For me? You know the deal. In exchange for your Lugers. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> this thing is too cool. Yes! Now this is my kind of weapon. All right! Huh? <laughs> hey, this thing's empty. You cheated me. Up there, plenty of ammo, just for you. Way up there? Give me a boost and I'll get it for you. All right, all right. Ow! My back! You're heavier than you look. Hurry up! Happy now? What? Now that your knight has made his appearance, he can join you in your descent into death. Okay, let's do it! Wait here, Claire! Time to test out my new toy! <laughs> we assume the role of Steve, wielding the newfound submachine guns that we had given him. This interlude proves to be a, an enjoyable diversion from the regular game, offering a brief break from the more challenging aspects of it. The opportunity to unleash the submachine guns on the zombies in our path adds an element of excitement to the experience, creating a fun and satisfying segment within the overall narrative. It was dirty work, but this area is now clean. See? You can depend on me. You see? This thing is a lot more reliable than any person. Than people? Steve. What were you doing here? Who brought you here and where is your family? Shut up! I don't want to talk about it! Steve... Never mind. Let's get going! Following Steve, our journey leads us to a platform that unexpectedly gives way beneath our feet, sending both Steve and Claire tumbling to the ground. Claire, are you okay? Steve, behind you! No! Shoot him! Wait! I... I can't! No! Steve! No! Steve. Father. Father. 
father. <laughs> Dad I used to work for Umbrella. I tried to steal information, intending to sell it off to the highest bidder. He was caught. Mom was killed. And we were sent here. Oh, Steve. He was a fool to do something so reckless. So stupid. It's okay now. Just rest. This is why I appreciate Steve's character. Admittedly, up to this point, he's been a bit irritating. From adopting a bravado with Claire, only to end up trapped in the same predicament without freeing himself, to reacting like a petulant child when Claire suggests he shared the Lugers they found, Steve's behavior can be perplexing. The portrayal of Steve sounding more like a 14-year-old than a 17-year-old doesn't contribute positively either. However, Steve's narrative takes a poignant turn with his heartfelt confession about his father's actions leading to their imprisonment on Rockford Island. The tragedy deepens as we learn of Steve's mother's demise at the hands of Umbrella. This reveals him as a troubled individual. The duration of his presence on the island before the outbreak remains undisclosed, leaving his past largely unknown. Considering the detrimental work environment under Umbrella and reckless actions of his father, Steve's childhood likely suffered. While I might be just justifying a less than ideal character portrayal, I don't believe Steve is entirely to blame. Given the circumstances he's faced, he emerges as a tragic character with a genuinely good heart. Despite any frustrations, it's challenging to fault him considering the adversity he has endured. Entering the door beneath the walkway, we traverse a hallway that leads to a room featuring a painting of a diorama. The painted scene displays two additional paintings on each side of the room, yet the actual room contains only one. Within the space, we retrieve the blue eagle plate. Exiting through the room where Steve and Claire were previously trapped, we return outside and find ourselves in another courtyard, this one housing a tank. Opening a door within this courtyard leads us back to the main courtyard. Retracing our steps through the path we initially took upon entering the training facility, we return to the courtyard where Alfred had attempted to snipe us. Placing the blue plate in the designated indentation on the second floor balcony, we gain access to the compartment containing the blue emblem card. Returning to check on Steve, we discover his absence. We proceed into the hall beneath the walkway and use the elevator to ascend to the second floor. Using the blue emblem card on the shutter, we access what appears to be a more advanced security room. Encountering an information panel on the wall, we learn about a new creature called the Albinoid, a result of injecting the T-virus into a salamander. The panel reveals that after incubation, the Albinoid can undergo a significant size increase growing up to 7 feet long in a mere 10 hour time span. Examining the console, we uncover the army proof. We are able to use the camera that leads to the previously inaccessible lab. We zoom in on the picture in the back of the room to reveal the numbers inscribed on it are 1126. This image also bears a striking resemblance to the one in the painting with the room featuring the diorama. With the newfound code, we unlock the door in the security room, enabling us to return to the main hall in the training facility now that the lockdown has been lifted. Using the biohazard card, we open the shutter and input the code to unlock the door leading to the lab. Grabbing the picture, we find ourselves ambushed by the albinoids. A sense of urgency sets in as we realize the need to escape the lab before the timer runs out. Going back to the room with the diorama, we place the picture on the wall, which triggers the opening of a hidden room, unveiling a actual diorama that replicates the training facility. Within this miniature, we retrieve the gold key, 
This key will unlock another door within the main building we previously explored. Descending to the basement level via the elevator again, we utilize the blue emblem card near the shutter. Inside, we secure the grenade launcher. Making our way back to the main building, we take the gold key through the hall just before the gold Luger gun trap. Entering the key into the door, we enter a space adorned with several paintings on the walls. Examining the file positioned in front of the grand painting at the room's front, we come across a message addressed to the new family master. Alfred. The document extends congratulations on Alfred assuming the mantle of the Ashford family's leadership. It details a family tradition wherein each head is presented with a gift from their butler. This tradition originated when Veronica, the family's founder, received a commemorative golden teacup. The file subtly provides the key to solving a puzzle within the room. You need to select the paintings in order of succession. The second and third masters, father and son, were bestowed similar teacups. The lineage then passed to the son's brother and, eventually, to Alfred's grandfather. Following Alfred's grandfather, his father Alexander assumed leadership. The file suggests a decline in the family's prestige during Alexander's reign, expressing hope that the Ashford family will regain its former glory under Alfred's guidance. Activating the buttons beneath the paintings in the specified order, we ascend to the depiction of Alfred. Upon pressing the button associated with his portrait, the wall pivots, unveiling a revelation the true master of the Ashford family, Alexia. On the same shelf that would contain the letter from the butler, on this side, we grab the vase. We make a discovery within, a red decorative ant queen. We run to the second floor safe room, armed with the gold lugers obtained from the trade with Steve. We then unlock the door in the safe room. Examining the room, which appears to be Alfred's office, we come across a memo on the desk providing various directions corresponding to each digit. Activating the computer yields further insights into this memo. After revisiting the snuff film, we're prompted to enter a password. To decipher this password, we navigate to a particular object and press each direction based on the numbers specified in the memo. After being unexpectedly confronted by the Bandersnatch, we navigate through the new opening and we make our escape onto a bridge. This setting provides an opportunity to showcase elements of gothic horror as the camera pans to the castle. Arriving at what looks to be a once-was lively garden, we ascend the stairs and enter a small castle. Stepping into the dark and dingy interior, we are disrupted by the sudden onslaught of annoying ass bats. Ascending the stairs, we encounter some more disturbed artwork. Keep focus, brother. Our enemy is only a little girl. Oh, why is this taking so long? My apologies, Alexia, but I have been doing my best. The revival of the Ashford family depends on your success, brother. I am aware of that, Alexia. I will revive the family name myself and make you the master of the glorious Ashford family. Do not worry, brother. I will handle them both myself. Who is there? Is someone at the corridor? What is it, Alexia? N nothing. I believe I must have been imagining things. Let us go, brother. Having glimpsed at the true master of the Ashford family, we enter the room where they were last seen. In the absence of Alexia and Alfred, we find a music box playing the same tune heard earlier in Alfred's office. Upon closer examination, we close the box, causing the bed to lift, revealing the silver key. An item for unlocking more doors in the main building. 
As the top of the bed slams shut again, we attempt to ascend the ladder, though it seems to be locked at the top. To progress, we place the red ant in the top of the music box, enabling us to retrieve the music plate within. We go back to the main building and utilize the silver key on the second floor door. Here we enter a lounge room. Inside, a grand piano catches our attention, featuring a slot that seems to require an item insertion. Proceeding to use the silver key on the door on the first floor, we step into a room occupied by two bandersnatches. At the desk situated at the room's focal point, we uncover Hunk's report to Alfred. While the report may not directly contribute to the ongoing narrative, its presence shows a connection between the Ashfords and Umbrella Corporation. In the room's center, we discover another Blue Eagle plate which we promptly grab before making our exit. Returning to the prison area of Rockford Island, we carry the hemostatic medicine to Rodrigo as a gesture of gratitude for rescuing us at the game's outset. What are you doing here? Hemostatic medicine? How kind of you. Thanks. Here, let me help you with that. Thanks, but I can take care of myself. Just go. Keep it. It was a gift from my brother, but... Thanks. Here, let me give you this in return. You might need it later on. Now go. Don't worry about me. Leaving the lighter with him, Rodrigo reciprocates by giving us a lockpick. Swiftly returning to the guillotine, we insert the blue emblem into the door right behind it. Progressing through this new path leads us to the area just outside the hall with a security checkpoint. Racing to the far end, we successfully shift a box that had obstructed a door earlier, granting us access to items previously inaccessible behind the security checkpoint. Entering the building situated behind the guillotine, we encounter what seems to be an infirmary. However, the ominous music hints at an atmosphere far from reassuring. <laughs> suggesting that this space may harbor more than just the typical medical supplies. The foreboding ambiance adds a layer of suspense, leaving us on edge as we explore further into the unknown. In the room adjacent to the previous one, we come across the chilling anatomist's note. The author of the note reveals a disturbing psychopathic nature, resembling the sick fascination with killing and dissecting people, reminiscent of infamous figures like Jeffrey Dahmer. It becomes evident that Alfred not only tolerated, but supported the anatomist's gruesome experiments by providing the necessary equipment. The note cryptically alludes to a basement secret shared only between the anatomist and Alfred, vowing to keep it hidden from everyone else. With the goal of finding this secret room, we enter the door next to the body bag. The room reveals itself as a crematorium, adorned with blood and torture devices, as well as more of the undead. Amidst the grim scene, a briefcase catches our attention. Thanks to the lockpick Rodrigo provided, we open the case to find handgun parts. These components allow us to assemble a three-round burst handgun with a stock, reminiscent of Leon's from Resident Evil 2. Entering back into the main part of the infirmary, we are suddenly startled by the sounds of chewing. Successfully overcoming the former doctor and retrieving a false eye from his skull, we carefully place the eye into the model of the human torso. This action opens a passage just behind us, leading us down a set of stairs. Navigating through the halls, we enter what appears to be a more leisurely torture room, possibly designed for Alfred to savor the twisted work of the deranged doctor. Descending further into the basement, we encounter a room adorned with large statues, one of them gripping a rusty sword.
Our task is to move the statue in the center, ensuring that the shield faces the one wielding the sword before the room is filled with gas. This reveals the presence of the piano roll hidden within the Iron Maiden. Securing the piano roll, our next destination is back at the main building's second floor, where we can insert the new found item into the piano. As we make our way back to the main building, a familiar figure emerges. Greetings! You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Who are you? Let's just say that I'm a ghost, coming back to haunt your dear brother. It seems there's not much explaining to do, is there? I was the one who attacked this island. Who'd have thought you'd be hanging about? <laughs> All the better for me. Now that the cat dragged in this nice surprise, your ever so caring brother will definitely show up. I must thank you for being such good bait. I don't know what went on between you two, but you have them all wrong. My brother is not the kind of person you think he is. I despise Chris. Uh, what are you gonna do to him? you may be of some further use to me. I'm going to let you live a little longer. It's Wesker, and this time transcending his previous portrayal as a moronic backstabber, Wesker has transformed into a genuinely opposing villain. This evolution in character marks a definitive interpretation that Resident Evil would continue to explore throughout the series, at least until more recent developments. Upon entering the lounge room, we insert the piano roll into the piano, uncovering a slot beneath the glowing machine. Within this slot, we find the blue ant. This item can be utilized back at the castle, specifically in the room opposite to where we obtain the music plate. Heading back to the castle, we come to find that it is now infested by more of the undead. We ascend to the top floor and enter a room nearly identical to its counterpart on the opposite end of the hall. On the desk, a letter from Alexia to Alfred is seen. The letter conveys her firm belief that the Ashford family's glory will be resurrected through Alfred's courage and strength as an honored soldier. The letter starkly demotes Alfred, referring to him as nothing more than a soldier. It becomes evident that Alexia has assumed the role as sole head of the Ashford family. Placing the blue ant into the top of the music box, we then insert the music plate within. The top of the bed descends, unveiling a ladder mirroring the one on the other side. Climbing up, we find ourselves on a large carousel adorned with a picture of an ant on the wall. The ant's mouth reveals a space for a key item. Moving to the opposite side of the carousel, we discover a silver dragonfly on a chair. Upon closer inspection, we detach the wings from the dragonfly and insert it into the hole. The carousel spins, connecting a ladder on the center pillar to an opening on the landing above. In this elevated space, we come across a newspaper clipping featuring a snippet about a 10-year-old girl genius who graduated at the top of her class from a prestigious university. The Umbrella Corporation extended an offer to her as head researcher, and though it's not explicitly mentioned, it becomes apparent that this prodigious girl is none other than Alexia. We push a crate towards a case filled with taxidermied butterflies. 
and stepping on it allows us to retrieve the green book resting atop the shelf. This book unveils a confession letter written by Alfred, delving into his infatuation with his own sister, Alexia. Alfred perceives Alexia as the queen, with himself playing the role of a loyal servant at her beck and call. This dynamic draws a clear parallel to the recurring themes of ants and their colonies throughout the game portraying Alexia as the queen and Alfred as merely another devoted ant following the whims of his monarch. Seizing the Air Force proof beneath the green book, we now possess the complete set of plaques needed to gain entry to the plane at the airport. Descending the ladder, we enter Alexia's room. Claire Redfield, hold it right there. We meet each other at last. A pity I must say goodbye so soon. I am Alexia Ashford. For the pride of the Ashford family, I will kill you! Wait! What's going on? Ah! Steve! A secret door! After her! Are you okay? I'm fine. It's just a scratch. This must be... What? No! Wait a second. What just happened? So there never was an Alexia after all. You mean, he thinks he's two people? Okay, that's it. Let's get out of here. The self-destruct system has been That freak! Activated. He's trying to blow us up along all with the entire facility. Come on, we gotta get to that airport. Right. A startling revelation becomes evident, as Alfred had been impersonating Alexia all along. Claire grapples with the realization that there never might have been an Alexia Ashford at all, with Alfred assuming both roles the whole time. This discovery introduces an interesting contradiction though, especially when considering the film we witnessed earlier in the game, where we can clearly see Alexia and Alfred. Claire! Better get out of here too. Right. Let's go. Against the backdrop of the blaring alarms, we hasten our return to the underground airport. Following the established tradition of Resident Evil, the self-destruct sequence is initiated, and our objective is to make a swift escape. Inserting the Air Force, Army, and Navy proofs into their designated positions, we gain access to the plane. <laughs> Take off unless we raise the bridge. Leave that to me. You stay here and make preparations for takeoff. Grabbing the control lever from the ground in order to raise the bridge ahead, we take the elevator back to the second floor where we employ the lever to elevate the bridge. Oh. 
though this action bars our return to the other side and re-entry into the plane. In order to navigate back to the aircraft, we must find an alternate route. Crossing the bridge, we enter a room occupied by a large group of bodies. Picking up the airport key, we hasten to the shutter, using the key to unveil a safe room equipped with healing items and ammunition. An elevator is obstructed by two crates jamming the door, preventing closure. Shifting these crates into the elevator, we free the passage, enabling us to ascend to the surface. Five minutes until detonation. Observing that the elevator reconnects with the training facility, we now have a clear route to return to the underground airport. However, we come face to face with the tyrant Alfred released. We take care of him with just a few grenade rounds, and we finally succeed in making our way back to the plane, ready to escape.
cargo room patch is open. I'll go back and check it out. Thanks. I've unlocked the cargo room door. Examining the loud bang leads us to a confrontation with the tyrant in the cargo room. This encounter fucking sucks, especially with the time sensitive crate mechanism that if not executed when he has taken enough damage, can result in the tyrant countering and continuing the fight. I die here. And luckily I made a save point not too far back, only back at the elevator on the island still, where uh, I have to fight the tyrant again. Oh, and uh, I failed many more times. All that said, I finally had a breakthrough. I utilized the green BOW rounds I discovered beyond the security checkpoint back at the island, as well as using some grenade rounds. I eventually managed to inflict enough damage on the tyrant and successfully ejected him from the plane. What was wrong? Oh, nothing. Just a giant cockroach that had to be stepped on. What's happening? I don't know. The plane just changed direction on its own. It's flying in autopilot mode. I can't switch over to manual control. My apologies. But I cannot let you escape now. <laughs> Alfred, you cross-dressing freak! Two point one seven degrees. That's the Antarctic. We're over the Antarctic. What? Hey, those are the seaplanes that left the island right before us. Then that must mean this place belongs to Umbrella. The game presents a save option, 
marking the culmination of the first half of Resident Evil Code Veronica. Surprisingly, this milestone arrives after approximately three hours of gameplay, nearly rivaling the entire duration of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. trashed. Well, let's split up and find another way off this oversized freezer. Right. Okay, let's do it. We escape the wreckage of the plane and descend a nearby ladder. On one end, we find a safe room with distant banging sounds within. Inside, we discover Alexander's memo, shedding light on the Ashford family's involvement with Umbrella. Alexander reveals that his father, Edward Ashford, was one of the founding fathers of Umbrella, discovering the mother virus alongside Lord Spencer. This research led to the creation of the T-Virus. Umbrella was established as a front to conceal their viral studies. Alexander, too, was part of a top-secret project supporting Edward's research. After Edward's death, Alexander faced challenges in continuing his work. In the same facility, Alexander planned a room modeled after his mansion, a decision tied to the legacy of Trevor, referring to George Trevor, actually, the architect of the mansion in the first Resident Evil game. The project which he was working on was codenamed Veronica, which Alexander expressed his confidence that his success would restore the Ashford's family's name to former glory, aiming to revive the ancestor, Veronica. However, given the current state of affairs, it appears Alexander's aspirations may have faced setbacks or even failures. We ascend the stairs and enter a dormitory near the crash site. The atmosphere is tense as we explore the room filled with the dead. The undead suddenly rise, forcing us to navigate carefully to survive the onslaught. Among the chaos, we discover the worker's diary, a journal maintained by a lower level employee of the Antarctic facility. The diary reveals the worker's initial optimism about joining Umbrella for a career of success, only to be disillusioned by the harsh conditions that make the Antarctic facility feel more like a prison. As we delve deeper into the diary, we learn of a legend about the mysterious figure called Nosferatu and how he has been confined to the facility for over a decade. The worker becomes increasingly curious about Nosferatu, and even one night, the worker is disturbed by peculiar sounds echoing from deep below. The worker is torn between rationalizing the noises as a result of the harsh Antarctic environment and acknowledging if this is Nosferatu hidden beneath the surface. Upon entering a nearby door, a balcony unfolds before us. To the left, we enter a door near a broken section of balcony, leading to a mysterious cage and a metal cutting machine capable of transforming metal objects into new shapes. On the opposite side, a locked door is marked as the machine room. We descend back down the stairs and traverse the corridor adjacent to the previous safe room. We encounter these frustrating poison moths. These little shits can not only attack you directly, but they can also leave lingering larvae, a persistent threat that can even follow you between rooms, biting you and uh, then poisoning you. Passing through the double doors, we step into a factory environment. We enter a door marked with the bold label, Weapon. Inside the dimly lit armory, we confront the undead, dispatching of them and then finding an item at the end of a conveyor belt. 
we find the key to the mining room. As we explore further, we discover an AK-47 assault rifle within one of the lockers. Nearby, we discover a set of explosives rigged with a heat-sensitive detonator. Unfortunately, we lack the lighter, so we're unable to complete this puzzle. Entering the room boldly marked B.O.W., we find ourselves immersed in a chilling environment inhabited by T-virus-infected spiders. These arachnids resemble black widows with a sinister twist, proving to be more aggressive than their Raccoon City counterparts. A notable departure from the norm, these spiders possess the ability to even grapple you and then poison you as opposed to just spitting poison and then hitting you with their face. We go to a crate in the corner adorned with a barcode sticker marked for shipment to the BOW room. We grab this and make our way to the mining room, unlocking it with the key obtained from the armory. Venturing further into the mining room, we discover a vent shutoff mechanism with an octagonal receptacle designed for an emergency shutdown to counteract potential poisonous gas. Noting this information, we proceed to the power room, where we are ambushed by a pack of more Cerberus zombie dogs. We deal with these undead canines and then we navigate to the rear of the power room, activating the generator by pulling the designated lever. Running back to the front, we then successfully engage the power, rekindling life to the facility. Restoring visibility to the facility, we make our way back to the main factory and affix the BOW barcode onto the box on the conveyor belt. Observing a box go to the weapon armory before the BOW box travels up the belt, we go to the armory and witness a wall of flames obstructing the passage forward upon our arrival. Unfortunately, as Claire, we lack the means to traverse through these flames, leaving the magnum seen on the other side of the conveyor belt unreachable, compelling us to explore an alternative route. Venturing into the BOW room, we encounter a room enveloped in non-poisonous gas. Seizing the opportunity, we obtain the mask from the nearby window. In the safe room, after discovering the source of the persistent noise to be a rat within the locker, inside we find the butler's letter addressed to Alfred, expressing the butler's intentions to resign from the Ashford family's service. The letter reveals the butler's long history having served Alexander, Alfred's father. He extends condolences to Alfred, referencing the disappearance of Alexander 15 years ago and Alexia's accidental death during an experiment. Despite contemplating suicide, the butler decides against it, deeming it an insult to the memories of Alexander and Alexia. Instead, he opts to step down as the family's butler. Activating a switch within the locker, we unveil a hidden room, revealing the long-rumored Nosferatu. We retrieve a plant pot from the corner, discovering the machine room key taped to its bottom. Returning to the second floor of the factory, we use the key to unlock the machine room, revealing a control panel for the crane. Claire, it looks like there's an Australian observation base about seven miles away from here. That should be our target. Great news, and take a look at that. It's a digging vehicle. If we break the wall with it, we might have a chance. Okay, let's do it! I swear I like Steve. It's toxic gas! It's all my fault. Don't say that. Listen to me. We'll escape from here. Together. 
Come on. We've got to shut off the gas. If we split up, we'll have a better chance of stopping it. <sighs> okay. Steve! Don't forget. We'll get out of here. Together. Entering the machine room once again, thanks to the mask we picked up, we ascend to the upper floor of the power room to retrieve the valve handle. However, the base of the handle is currently square and unsuitable for shutting off the gas. Taking the valve handle over to the metal cutting machine, we shape it into an octagonal form. Returning to the mining room with the gas shut off, we successfully turn off the gas. <sighs> We're safe now. Think again, Claire. I shall enjoy watching you shriek in agony. Not this time! I'm gonna bust through that wall. Go for it. Right. Claire, maybe we can escape through there. Come on, let's go. On the now empty helipad, we discover a first aid spray in the corner and proceed to descend the steps with Steve. Okay, let's go! Come on, let's go! Are you scared? I'll wake that monster and come back. 
However, as you can see, we are met by Nosferatu. Surprisingly, this fight proves to be quite manageable, especially when using the rifle rounds into Nosferatu's chest and then the explosive bowgun bolts. It makes it quick to incapacitate him. I didn't take any damage in this fight. Steve! Are you all right? Claire! You're alive! you next time, Claire. We did it! We're finally out! <laughs> Look! There's a snowmobile over there! Perfect! We'll be able to ride right over to the Australian base with this! Yeah! Let's go! I won't forget about this, Claire. With that surprising revelation behind us, let's talk about Resident Evil Code Veronica's awe-inspiring soundtrack. In my opinion, this installment boasts the finest soundtrack in the entire Resident Evil series. It goes a step beyond that. I dare say the soundtrack of Code Veronica stands as one of the most exceptional in the entire realm of video game music, period. In the opening movie, the soundtrack kicks in with the powerful instruments. Featuring an insane orchestra and a haunting opera singer that reverberates through your ears as the game's title unfolds before you. Consider the impact of the subsequent track thrown into despair, which evokes a mix of deep sorrow 
hopelessness and a glimmer of optimism as players are released from the prison ready to confront the horrors of Rockfort Island. The first significant boss battle, The Tyrant, is accompanied by an epic track, a short but intense loop that pumps adrenaline through your veins as you desperately fend off the relentless onslaught of the overpowering foe. As we journey over the Antarctic in the plane with a slumbering Claire on Steve's shoulder, the track Midnight Sun unfolds. This track is truly beautiful, capturing the blossoming emotions Steve harbors for Claire. Hell, reflect on the recent cutscene we just witnessed. The overly dramatic track echoes the scene of dying Alfred facing his sister once again for the first time in 15 years. Despite the peculiar relationship between these siblings, it's undeniably difficult not to empathize with Alfred as he breathes his last breath in Alexia's arms. A moment of solace is found in the Safe Room track, a masterpiece that perfectly encapsulates the gothic horror ambiance, providing a haven from the monstrous threats outside. The soothing piano keys induce a sigh of relief. I obviously harbor an immense affection for this soundtrack, and the depth of my admiration is such that I could likely produce an entire video dissecting each individual track for this game. That said, I won't be doing this, but this won't be the last time that I express my love for this soundtrack.
up on a lead given to me by Leon. It's brought me here. This stands out as one of the most memorable character entrances in the Resident Evil series. The theme accompanying Chris as he scales the side of Rockford Island is nothing short of perfection. The line he delivers at the end adds an extra layer of intensity, signaling that the real action is about to begin. Interestingly, Rockford Island doesn't seem to have undergone the explosive fate suggested during the self-destruction sequence earlier. With the collapsed entrance behind us, we press on into the cave, where we encounter a familiar face. I didn't expect to find another living person left on this island. Who are you? I came here looking for a certain girl. A girl? Have you seen anyone named Claire Redfield? Did you just say... Claire? You know who she is, don't you? Don't worry about her. I helped her escape. Several planes took off from this island not long ago. While I can't say for certain, she was probably on one of them. I see. I guess my sister owes you. Thanks for helping me. Everyone's gone. I may be the only other person left. Go on. Follow your sister and get off this island. Guided by the text prompt indicating our next goal, we make a beeline for the item box, equipping ourselves with the grenade launcher and the calico handguns. Shared between Claire and Chris through the item box, we prepare for the upcoming battle against the worm. While this might not be the most realistic game mechanic, I mean, sharing the box between Claire and Chris, it does add a layer of convenience to the game and I actually prefer it this way. Navigating through the door to the right leads us to another underground cave for our encounter with the Colossal Worm. The battle itself isn't excessively challenging, but the real struggle lies in finding the opportunity to actually strike. The worm's brief appearances above ground demand really good timing, especially considering the risk of being knocked down if it hits you during this resurfacing that it does. Take it. 
As Rodrigo has drawn his last breath, he gave us the lighter. Returning to the recently visited safe room, we utilize this lighter on the lamp, unlocking a compartment beneath the carved figure. This hidden space reveals two submachine guns reminiscent of those that Steve wielded. We secure them in the item box before making our way to the elevator situated in the cave's boss area. The elevator transports us back to the training facility, where we enter the courtyard that once housed the tank. Employing the same button Alfred used to shift the tank, we proceed to the elevator situated just behind it, leading to a lower room. Here we discover a safe room and a set of color-coded drawers, presenting us with a puzzle. Consulting the volcanic painting on the wall, which articulates lava burns forest, flows to sea, forms earth, we systematically pull the red, green, and blue drawers, culminating in a satisfying click that unlocks the brown drawer at the bottom. It reveals a Luger replica, devoid of any purpose in the game actually, making me really wonder why Capcom even decided to put this in the game. Returning to the corridor before the fighter hangar entrance, we spot a battery on the ground. Lacking the required key item to proceed through the adjacent door, we decide to take the battery for later use. Evading the spiders, we utilize the elevator to return to the training facility, placing the battery in the lift to restore functionality. Turning left, we acquire the chemical storage key and come across a report detailing an enhanced anti-decay alloy called Deployed. Originally intended for BOW storage capsules, the project was scrapped in favor of using the Deployed material for the blue portion of the Eagle Plate. To dissolve of the blue segment, a combination of two chemicals Clement A and Clement E is required. As the file states, the E type changes color at a specific temperature, coincidentally matching the completion date of the training facility. Alexia? No! She's already fully awake. Chris, oh little fishy, come see my hook. Chris, I'm sending some company to keep you entertained. Consider this a small welcoming gift from me. Enjoy! <laughs> Stepping onto the courtyard from the walkway, we witness the unfortunate descent of the Blue Eagle plate into the depths beneath the training facility. Moving into an adjacent hallway, we notice the wall has been demolished, unveiling the entrance to the laboratory. We grab a side pack on a shelf and return to the elevator near the security room. We then descend to the first floor of the training facility. In the room with the diorama, we observe a completion date for the training facility on the plaque, December 8th. An empty slot in the diorama is seen here, but we currently lack the item needed to fill it. Descending further into the basement of the training facility via the elevator, we discover a new staircase leading even deeper below. A mounted shotgun on the wall grabs our attention, and we make a mental note to return for it later. Moving through the door, we find ourselves in what appears to be the same lab where the tyrant was unleashed. Activating a console upstairs causes a tube to descend revealing an ammo magazine for the assault rifle. In the next room, we locate the elevator that Steve and Claire used to access the basement. A doorknob can be found in the elevator, and this can be used to open the door in the second floor hallway of the training facility.
Certain rooms feature these scanning machines that detect your presence. If you fall within their line of sight, hunters are unleashed and will attack you. The hunters this time around prove to be pretty tough, though they're... Toughness doesn't quite surpass that of the hunters we encountered in Resident Evil 1 or 3. Similar to dealing with the Bandersnatches, it becomes crucial to wield a weapon capable of staggering these guys to avoid being sunlocked by them, particularly when facing multiple hunters at once. I would say the submachine guns prove to be the most effective tool against these guys. Entering a nearby door, we find yet another lab stocked with chemicals. Remembering the date of completion of the training facility and adjusting the temperature on the chemical storage case to 12.8 degrees yields the Clement E, one of the necessary chemicals. Introducing the new enemy type to Code Veronica, the sweepers resemble the hunters in functionality, but they have the added danger of poisoning you as well as just swiping you with their claws. Like the hunters, it's advisable to use a weapon that can stagger these guys to prevent being overwhelmed and stunlocked. Returning to the second floor lab of the training facility, we utilize the doorknob on the door that doesn't have one, bringing us back up to the walkway that collapsed on Claire and Steve. Heading to the right, we acquire the tank object. Observing the tank object, it becomes evident that this integrates into the training facility's diorama on the floor below. Hastening our descent, we carefully insert the tank into the designated spot. This action triggers the silent movement of the painting behind us, unveiling the turntable key and a note detailing a concealed passage. The note unravels the story of a once-damaged underground route to Alfred and Alexia's castle. Now rendered impassable, Alfred's alternative plan involves constructing a bridge to the castle, followed by sealing the original waterway entrance. The cryptic message hints at accessing this underground entrance via the diorama in our current location. Behind a protective barrier of lasers, we spot a lever on the wall and three indentations mirroring the proofs we used during our initial escape from the island by plane. As we race back towards the turntable to progress further, Wesker unexpectedly crosses our path. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. Wesker? He's still alive? <laughs> what are you doing here? I came for Alexia. Who? An organization hired me to capture her. Wait! You attacked the island! And my sister! <laughs> you have no idea how much I hate you. You destroyed my plans. So now I've sold my soul to a new organization. Now, die. <laughs> Here's a little secret, Chris. I figured out that your sister is now in the Antarctic. With Alexia. It's too bad you won't be seeing her again. <laughs> Alexia? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what strategic gain Wesker would have by just tossing Chris against the tube here rather than just killing him. Guess Alexia's presence just pisses him off that much. We ride the turntable to the ground floor of the training facility and enter the smaller security room. There, near the locker, a hole has been blown straight through the wall. 
We take this path down to the base floor of the courtyard, where we witness the Blue Eagle plate fall. Entering the caged area, we descend the ladder to the basement of the training facility, encountering a grate with a blue card reader. This is accessible via the blue biohazard card. Turning back, we pull the lever near the ladder, activating the fan in the room to clear out all the poison gas from the basement. Making our way to the main courtyard of the training facility, we take the elevator down to the heliport. Unfortunately, we find ourselves unable to lower the bridge due to a malfunction in the oil pressure system. Crossing the bridge, we enter the room where Claire obtained the airport key and discover that the control for the bridge's oil pressure is out of order, with one of the containers used to regulate the pressure now broken. In this quick puzzle, we drain the oil from the 3 and 5 tanks to achieve the desired amount of 7, which is marked as the red line on the 10 tank. By leaving 2 lines in the 3 tank and then using the 5 and 3 tanks to fill the 10 tank to the line, we successfully regulate the oil pressure. After the ambush of zombies, we cross the bridge and regain access to the platform where we initially boarded the plane. After eliminating the hunter and deactivating the platform to halt the pulsing electricity, we secure the three proofs and carry them across the bridge to the surface level of the training facility. Before leaving the airport, we grab the blue biohazard card. This we need for opening the path in the basement we just discovered prior to our visit here. Returning to the training facility, we descend to the basement via the ladder in the courtyard and use the blue biohazard card to open the shutter, granting access to the weapon workshop previously explored by Claire. Here we find the Clement A and combine it with the Clement E to create the chemical needed to dissolve the deployed material on the Blue Eagle plate. Additionally, we discover parts for the Glock 17 handgun, which when attached don't seem to make a significant difference at all. I opt to stick with Claire's 3 round burst handgun left in the item box, as this is much better. These parts here aren't very necessary. Heading back to the opposite side of the basement, we descend the stairwell to retrieve the shotgun from the wall. However, Grabbing the shotgun raises the stairwell once again, trapping us in the lower level. Navigating the waterway, we locate a ladder which leads back to the hallway before the fighter jet hangar and the safe room. Although we can't use the original elevator to access the training facility since it's still on the surface level. With this new shortcut discovered, we quickly return to the stairway. Placing the shotgun back down, we ascend the stairway to make our way to the diorama room. Inserting the three proofs into the slots in the diorama room, we pull the lever unveiling a ladder leading further below. Navigating through the spider-infested halls, we descend another ladder to explore the depths. In this area, the sound of flowing water guides us to the Blue Eagle. In the water is the massive albinoid. This guy will send shock waves through the water while also attempting to attack. I opt to run into the water, grab the blue eagle plate, and then run back out before engaging in any needless battle. <laughs> You don't really have to engage in a fight at all here, so I wouldn't. Combining the mixed chemical with the eagle plate results in the creation of the gold halberd, the key item needed for accessing the fighter jet hangar. Returning to the basement floor level via the training facility elevator, we retrieve the shotgun and ascend the ladder just past the waterway, now equipped to leave Rockford Island. <laughs>
As the triumphant music plays, the desire I have to pilot a fighter jet to the Antarctic base and rescue my sister has never been stronger than in this exhilarating moment. Entering the Antarctic base, we take note of an emergency exit elevator in the fighter hangar before delving further into the facility. The Antarctic base exhibits signs of damage caused by Alexia's tendrils. Dealing with these obstacles proves manageable as we shoot them to retract and clear the way. Descending the steps into the hallway near the first safe room in the Antarctic, we encounter a zombie ambush and a moth parasite? a one-time enemy that latches onto us. Thankfully, unlike the larvae, these parasites do not pursue us in the other rooms. In the safe room, we insert the gold halberd into a slot next to the dresser, unlocking a cabinet containing a paperweight and Alfred's diary. Alfred's entries reveal the existence of a sealed room in the facility hallway, initially inaccessible to him. He outlines a method involving three jewels corresponding to the Ashford family members, Alexander, Alexia, and Alfred. Alfred gains access to the sealed room, discovering a shocking secret about Alexia and his birth. According to his account, Alexander orchestrated their conception as a ploy to cover for his poor leadership. Alfred explains that he and Alexia experimented on Alexander, turning him into the mindless monster known as Nosferatu, the same monster that was chained in the Antarctic basement. Alexia, seeking a solution, conducts the experiment on herself, requiring 15 years of sleep for success. During this period, Alfred serves as the public face for the Ashford family. While this diary does answer some questions, Many of the mysteries about the Ashford family remain unresolved. Exiting the safe room, we attempt to access the lower floor of the factory, only to be thwarted by a sealed door. Opting for a different route, we ascend to the second floor and open the door to the factory, revealing a lower level that has been completely encased in ice. Venturing into the machine room, we secure the valve handle from the gas shutoff pipe. As we make our way out, a sudden zombie onslaught erupts from beneath the ice, prompting a hasty retreat to the safety of the second floor. With the newfound access, we traverse the collapsed section of the platform, reaching the crane situated at the room's forefront. Unfortunately, the crane key is missing, so we cannot use this now. Proceeding through the nearby door on the platform, we encounter more of Wesker's machines adorning the hallway's ceiling. What? He's here? Inside the adjacent electronic doors, we discover a room housing a switch with a prominent glowing blue button. Activating the switch initiates a lift, allowing us to refill the fire extinguisher, which we had depleted all the way at the beginning of the game. Descending in the nearby elevator, we return to the armory. Using the fire extinguisher on the wall of flames, we grab the coveted magnum. Rushing to the rear of the armory, we employ the lighter on the detonator for the locker, resulting in an explosive opening that grants us a generous supply of handgun rounds. Not that I've really been using handgun rounds at all since I even got to the Antarctic base. Exiting the armory, we utilize the elevator at the back of the room, discovering a slot for the water drain valve beside a pool of water to the right. However, the slot's square shape renders the now octagonal valve handle incompatible, temporarily stalling our progress. We reluctantly leave. 
Returning to the hallway, we dash to the end and access the elevator adjacent to the end of the hall. Upon exiting, we hear the unmistakable sounds of splashing water. The source of the commotion reveals itself to be a sweeper attempting to assail us. Killing him, we spot a small carousel at the room's center, and nearby on the ground lies a numbered wing object, hinting at an existence of multiple of such items. Proceeding through the door directly opposite the elevator we just exited, we step into a frozen hallway. To the left, there's a safe room offering relief. Within, we discover a spot equipped with a crank featuring an octagonal hole. Using it, we observe a connected mechanism just beside it. This allows us to flip a switch to the left of the mechanism, activating power to the lab. With the frozen hallway now illuminated, we deal with the infected obstructing the path and enter the electronic door. Inside, we find a room reminiscent of the area where the map is typically acquired in the original Resident Evil game. This aligns with the section of the facility mentioned in Alexander's diary. Similar to the statue in the mansion, the map is visible in the pot just above. This time, we need to push the statue into the cracked portion of the ground beside the dresser. Doing so, the statue collapses, granting us access to the map for the Antarctic lab. Down the red hallway, a golden tiger statue catches our attention, serving as another nod to the statue in Resident Evil 1. Intriguingly, this time, the eyes of the tiger statue already contain gems. Removing the blue gem causes the statue to spin, revealing a socket that, when combined with the wheel, creates a square-shaped socket required to drain the water back in the room on the second floor of the factory. Interestingly, the only way to return the tiger statue to its original face is to reinsert the gem. On this side, we discover some magnum bullets. For now, we leave both gems, since the statue spins every time we attempt to take both. Entering the door opposite of the tiger statue, we step into a decontamination chamber. A wet, slimy sound fills the air. Upon investigation, we find the room infested with ants and a giant anthill in the center. On the platform adjacent to the anthill, we locate the second wing object. Moving to the right side of the room, a hallway with blood-stained walls leads us to a door, revealing the same room where Alexia was awakened by Alfred. Beside the console, its screen flickering with static, we discover a virus research report. Delving into its contents, we learn that the T. Veronica virus was derived from a queen ant, leaving the author, revealed to be Alexia Ashford, astounded by its potential. Alexia attributes the failure of the virus on Alexander Ashford to its hyperactivity, seizing control of the host's body. She discerns a solution, maintaining a low temperature to slow the cellular changes induced by the virus. The report implies a 15-year time frame for the virus to reach its pinnacle in Alexia's body. Despite Alfred's admiration, it becomes evident that Alexia holds a low opinion of him, deeming him inept and merely a loyal soldier. Alexia envisions a grandiose plan seeking to wield the virus's power to dominate the entire world, envisioning a global existence solely for serving her. She draws a parallel between her future as a world leader and an organized ant colony, echoing her obsession with these insects. Adjacent to the console, a platform holds a device inscribed with, As twins, Alexia and I are two sides of a coin. Symbols adorn this inscription, and activating the panel presents a sequence of symbols to press. This forms a puzzle entwined with the paperweight obtained in the factory safe room. Following the directive to select symbols opposite those on the device, we unveil a square slot. Placing the paperweight inside reveals the pod in which Alexia resided. Surprisingly, a lifeless Alfred descends from the pod. Examining his body, we discover a ring with a small blue gem concealed within it. Acquiring the ring, we rush to the opposite end of the massive anthill, discovering a room resembling a study and small laboratory. Dispatching of the zombies within, we illuminate the room with a lantern. On the desk, across from the lantern, we stumble upon Alexia Ashford's research report on the Queen Ant. Alexia delves into her fascination with the ant ecosystem, particularly the hierarchical structure where ordinary ants serve as slaves to the queen. She draws a parallel between her relationship and that of the queen ant, and that in the event of the queen's demise, it would spell the end of the entire ant colony. 
Alexia's research takes a pivotal turn with the discovery of an ancient virus within the ant queen. Concentrating on ant biology, she implants the mother virus discovered by Oswell E. Spencer, Umbrella's co-founder, into the queen ant, unleashing what she deems the ideal virus. Alexia revisits the catastrophic impact of the virus on Alexander's brain, leading to her decision to enter a 15-year cryogenic sleep. She also reveals that the antidote for the poison gas released by Nosferatu cannot be cured using the standard blue herb. Instead, it can be found on the B2 floor of the lab, where the weapon-slash-chemical warehouse is located. In a conclusive revelation, Alexia names the virus she created the T. Veronica virus. Within the small lab, an experiment tube reveals the deceased giant ant queen and a lifeless anthill, signifying the demise of the entire colony as referenced in Alexia's report. Returning to the room where the lab map was discovered, an attempt to pass through the locked double doors reveals a biohazard symbol, indicating the need for a key labeled with the biohazard symbol to gain access. Backtracking to the room where the fire extinguisher was refilled, we utilize the crank with the square socket to drain the water in the tank. Descending into the tank, we encounter and dispatch of another sweeper with the aid of the submachine guns. Inside of the tank, we find the crane key. Swiftly making our way to the lab's crane, we use the key. Who could have done this? <laughs> Alexia. That is how I dispose of insignificant bugs. Said the spider to the fly, How do you wish to die? Although we are faced with the giant spider, I opt to just bypass the confrontation altogether. Next to Nosferatu, Alexander's piercing is retrieved, featuring a small green gem akin to Alfred's ring. Returning to the room with the carousel, a blinking object near a large vase in the water is discovered. Inspecting it, we obtain the third wing object. Passing through the double doors leads to a room reminiscent of the iconic main hall in the Resident Evil series, echoing the file we previously read. Upstairs, the lone door is locked. At the top of the staircase, a painting of the Ashford family, Alexander, Alfred, and Alexia is found, each with holes in the finger, ear, and neck respectively. Extracting gems from Alfred and the infected Alexander's ring and earring, we place them in the corresponding locations on the painting. A space remains in Alexia's neck, suggesting the need for a gem from Alexia herself. Descending, we discover Claire, covered in a green sludge behind the stairwell. Using a knife, we free her. Claire. It's important to note here that if Claire becomes poisoned during the Nosferatu encounter, you'll need to retrieve the antidote that was mentioned in the file Alexia had written about. In this case, Claire wasn't poisoned, so there's no need to worry about that in this run. Chris! I missed you so much. I know, but we have to get out of here. Not yet. We have to find Steve. Who's Steve? He's a boy who escaped from that island with me. But then a monster attacked us and we got separated. So that means Steve is still somewhere in this base? I'm sure of it. <laughs> it's Alexia! Alexia? There really is an Alexia? <laughs> It is almost time, you genetically inferior siblings. <laughs> ah! 
after her. She might know where Steve is. Let's go. <laughs> Chris! Uh. No! Just go. I'll be fine. But Chris... You've got to save Steve. Go! Upon hearing Steve's call for help, we rush to his aid, continuing our journey as Claire. In the safe room, we shift the bookshelf aside and reveal a spot for the shotgun. Placing the shotgun in the item box unlocks a hidden compartment behind the painting near the safe room's exit, yielding additional grenade launcher rounds. Advancing beyond the safe room, we traverse a hallway. As we pass through, Alexia's tentacles burst through the wall, launching a swift attack. The initial door is locked, and as we move towards the next one, another tentacle strikes. Utilizing the bowgun, we manage to fend off the tentacle. Entering the subsequent room, we discover a jail-like section of the complex. Ascending the stairs at the room's end, we encounter a platform seemingly situated just above the colossal ant colony explored by Chris. A door with a dragonfly indentation on the wall catches our attention, likely requiring the wing object collected by Chris. However, it remains unopenable for now prompting our return to the prison area. Climbing a small set of steps leads us to a peculiar area adorned with medieval paraphernalia, and even a cannon. The presence of this doesn't really make sense to me. Like, why is all this here? A file lies at the base of the cannon, and upon inspection, we discover it is a security file read by Alexander Ashford. In it, he discloses a closely guarded secret unveiling a self-destruction device in the lab's control room as a security measure in case of the secret's potential discovery. Activating this device through a computer will unlock all the doors in the facility and grant access to the elevator in the adjacent jail room, allowing an escape to the fighter jet hangar. Alexander cryptically notes that the code is the name of the revered ancestor of the Ashford family. It is fair to assume that this would be none other than Veronica Ashford. After reading this document, we utilize the cannon's handle to expose a key card encased in a crystal ball. A nearby trap springs, dropping a square-shaped object next to us. Placing the crystal ball in the designated spot causes it to shatter, revealing the key card needed for our escape. Entering the first door of the jail, we find a small room with a card reader at the far end. Using the obtained key card triggers the grate to open ahead, while the door behind us locks. Moving through the narrow pathway, we notice sets of armor on the sides, hinting at an impending revelation. that she did on her own father. She's completely insane. Uh, 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 What's wrong? Claire, can't breathe. Claire, help me. Claire.
With the infected Steve in our path, and the gray at the end of the hall closing, our sole objective becomes clear. We need to escape. I suck dick at this game. Well, the second time around I managed to escape the T. Veronica virus infected Steve. Thus unfolds what could be considered one of the most heart-wrenching scenes in Resident Evil history. While I understand that Steve's character is generally met with negativity, this moment is undeniably poignant. It's crucial to recognize that Steve was only 17 years old, and his entire life was tragically curtailed due to his father's misguided actions as an Umbrella employee. The sudden confession of love for Claire may seem abrupt, but we must remember Steve is just a teenager. His emotions, though intense, are entirely in line with the feelings typical of adolescence. While some may find it unrealistic for someone who has never experienced romantic interactions to express such sentiments, I can attest, based on personal experience at that age, that it is indeed authentic. Despite any perceived flaws, Steve emerges as a well-developed character. Although he started as a somewhat annoying and brash teenager, his character arc throughout the game demonstrates growth. It's undeniable that Steve's death has a profound impact, not only on Claire, but also on the players. Oh, and that soundtrack that accompanies the T. Veronica infected Steve's pursuit of Claire is absolutely phenomenal. Entitled Not Steve, that song masterfully encapsulates the eerie sensation of being pursued by someone who was once your ally. It manages to evoke a blend of epic intensity and underlying sadness, capturing the complexity of the situation. Adding to the emotional depth in this track playing during Steve's demise, aptly named Love Music.
beautiful piano melody that serenades the player as Steve passes away, coupled with the powerful orchestral performance that lingers as Claire grapples with the reality of Steve's irrevocable loss, creates a truly poignant experience. I wasn't exaggerating when I expressed my love for this soundtrack, and moving forward, I'll be talking about a lot more of these tracks towards the end of the game. <laughs> At last, I've found you, Alexia. Come with me. <laughs> You're responsible for the creation of the T. Veronica virus. And now the only existing sample is in your body. I want it. Now! You want it? You are not worthy of its power! Honestly, is Wesker even a villain in this game? He, he's kind of just an annoying douche, really. Oh yeah, and that super gothic, like, Count Dracula sounding theme here is cool as hell too. So since Wesker dipped and left us to fight Alexia alone, we are now stuck with a T. Veronica virus infected Alexia, and she face fucks us. Man, I fucking suck. Well, since Alexia violated me in the face here, we have to yet again go back to the previous save. This time around, I successfully navigate through the Alexia fight. It's surprisingly manageable, and I'm a bit taken aback that I died the first time. Alexia unleashes a stream of blood with her arm, leaving a visible trail. As soon as this happens, it's smart to dodge as swiftly as possible, as the flames that follow that could easily stun and trap you. When stun locked, Alexia can approach and execute you with a single shot, requiring no additional damage. However, the submachine guns proved highly effective this time, swiftly dispatching of her. Upon defeating her, a red glowing object catches our attention on the floor. Upon inspection, it turns out to be Alexia's choker. Taking it to the painting where we previously placed the gems from Alexander and Alfred, we examine the choker, extracting the red gem. Placing it to the painting unveils a concealed doorway. As we step through the door, a brief cutscene unfolds, showcasing an ongoing resurrection of the T. Veronica infected Alexia. It becomes apparent that she is far from being defeated. Stepping into the concealed chamber behind the painting, we find ourselves in a hallway that bears a striking resemblance to the one on Rockford Island, where Alexia and Alfred each had their separate rooms in the castle's upper reaches. 
While similarities persist, there are notable distinctions, particularly a pair of doors upon the entry and a solitary door in the left of the main section of the hallway. Opting for the lone door, we discover a study with sparse furnishings. Upon inspecting the desk at the far end, we uncover the sterile room key. This key is pivotal for unlocking the double doors in the main hall that we were just in. Emerging from the study, we promptly employ the key on the double doors in the main hall. Now that the door is ajar, we hasten back to the safe room where we initially activated the power, deactivating it this time. This move allows us to return to the tiger statue and retrieve the red and blue gems from its eyes without triggering any movement from the statue. We move through the hall with the gems in hand. Our first stop is Alfred's room where the insertion of the blue gem into the music box prompts it to open. Proceeding through the statue door, mirroring the one on Rockford Island Castle, we enter Alexia's room. Here, the music box plays, and after momentarily halting it, we utilize the red gem to unlock the music box and retrieve the music plate. Returning to Alfred's room, we place the music plate causing the top of the bed to descend, revealing a ladder for ascent. Climbing the ladder, we find a distinct room, unlike the previous encounter. Remarkably, it is in the same room where the Ashford twins were seen feeding the dragonfly to the ant colony, a masterfully executed full circle moment. On the wall, the portrait of Alexander in the room bears a conspicuous scratch a visual representation of the shame he brought upon the Ashford family. Throughout this game, we've been reminded of Alexander Ashford's actions leading to the metaphorical Dark Age of the Ashfords. However, the story has yet to unveil the reasons behind this pivotal moment. Within the Ant Hill Colony tube, we uncover a dragonfly object. Combining it with the other three dragonfly wings results in an almost complete dragonfly, with just one wing remaining to complete the object. Venturing back into the hall, we access the double doors that initially caught our attention. Beyond them lies another laboratory, and our immediate discovery is the Code Veronica report. The significance is not lost, considering this document shares the name with the game itself. Written by Alexander Ashford, the father of Alexia and Alfred, the report begins with Alexander expressing pride in identifying the inheritance element that administers the intelligence of man, as he puts it. The report delves into intricate scientific language, eventually alluding to the sampling of the gene from the great ancestor of the Ashford family, clearly referring to Veronica. Alexander details how he manipulated the gene's element, implanting it into the unfertilized egg of a surrogate mother. The outcome of this groundbreaking discovery was the birth of twins, a boy and a girl. While Alexander acknowledges the intelligence of the boy, he showers praise on the girl, deeming her a genius and heralding her as the revival of the great Ashford family ancestor, Veronica. Alexander concludes the report by naming the twins Alfred and Alexia Ashford expressing his belief that Alexia will bring greatness to the Ashford family. Sadly, Alexander never lives to witness this anticipated elevation, meeting his demise at the hands of his own children. This revelation stands as one of the most astonishing twists in the game. Alfred and Alexia are revealed to be test tube babies, born without a biological father, and birthed by a surrogate mother. It becomes evident that this revelation is a key factor that fueled the twins' anger, leading them to turn against their own father. Upon descending the elevator, a button on the console catches our attention. Pressing it causes a nearby case to open, revealing the fourth and final wing object. On the second floor of the lab, a door leads to the same hall where we briefly controlled Claire. Claire? Is that you, Claire? Chris? No! The door won't open! Hey, is Steve with you? <laughs> Steve, he... <laughs> Listen, Claire. We have to get out of here immediately. Can you unlock it from the inside? No, I can't. Chris, 
There should be a self-destruct system somewhere. If you activate it, all the electronic locks might be deactivated. As we traverse to the door that contained the cell block, Claire hands us a file, and within it, we discover the security card. Armed with the security card and the dragonfly object, we are now ready to initiate the self-destruction sequence. A special mention goes to the soundtrack here, titled, The Code is Veronica. It is my favorite track in the Resident Evil series. Its perfect blend captures the epic essence of the final moments of this emotionally turbulent and lengthy journey. As we approach the climax of this remarkable story, this track serves as an ideal companion to the closing moments of this great game. We ascend to the platform situated above the ant hill and insert the completed dragonfly object. Inside the room, we dispatch of a few zombies and locate the control console. Using the security card to access it, we are prompted to input the code. Recall from earlier that the code is the name of the great ancestor of the Ashford family, Veronica. With the code entered, the self-destruct sequence is initiated, signaling the need to make a swift exit. On a side note, I must express my appreciation for the fact that every Resident Evil installment concludes with a spectacular explosion, a fitting signature to this franchise. You made it! Of course! Come on, let's get out of here! simultaneously on three. Got it. One. Two. Three. Alexia makes a beeline for Claire, and we intervene before she can carry out her deadly intent. The Alexia fight proves challenging without the right weaponry, but fortunately, I am armed with the two most effective weapons, 
the Magnum, and the submachine guns. With these formidable tools, taking down Alexia becomes a manageable task. Before delving into the battle, I must take a moment to gush over another exceptional aspect of the game, the soundtrack. Alexia's boss theme titled Alexia Type 2 stands as one of my favorites in the Resident Evil franchise. The piano arrangement composed by the powerful orchestra and haunting opera vocals creates a truly phenomenal composition. I assert confidently that you won't encounter a more captivating soundtrack in the entire Resident Evil series. As previously mentioned, this encounter doesn't pose much difficulty with the right arsenal. I exhaust all magnum rounds on Alexia and, once depleted, switch to the submachine gun until she transitions to her second phase. That's right, Code Veronica used multiple boss phases before it became a common trend. <laughs> In this airborne phase, we gain access to the linear launcher, now at our disposal. The first person aiming can prove challenging, making it a bit tricky to land shots on Alexia. Nevertheless, successfully doing so marks the conclusion of the game. Well done, Chris. It turns out that Alexia's work wasn't much of anything. So now, the only thing left is revenge. Let her go, Wesker! You don't want her! Fine. Claire! Today's a good day. I came for Alexia, but killing you is even better. Sorry to disappoint you. But Alexia is gone. That's no longer a concern to me. I have Steve to work with. What? Steve. In his body, there's still a living T. Alexia virus. Steve should be a good specimen. Maybe he'll come back alive just as I did and be able to see your sister again. You freak! Don't you touch him! I'm sorry, dear heart. But my men have already. Get out of here, Claire. But what about? As a surviving member of Stars, I have to be Remember your promise. I'll end this once and for all. Say hello to my comrades who have killed. I don't know where you get your confidence, Chris.
The self-destruct system has been activated. All personnel evacuate immediately. The self-destruct system has been activated. All personnel evacuate immediately. Keep my promises. <laughs> Chris, promise me. Please promise that you won't leave me alone again. I'm sorry, Claire, but it's not over yet. There's still something we've got to do. You mean... Yeah! It's payback time. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now! Let's finish this once and for all! Upon concluding Code Veronica, my performance earns a D rank, completing the game in just over 7 hours for my initial playthrough. To my surprise, this underscores the game's difficulty, as even with what I perceive as a successful run, I received one of the lowest possible ranks for the story completion. A testament to Code Veronica's standing as one of the most challenging Resident Evil games to date. Upon receiving the notification, Battle Game, 
it becomes evident that a new mode has been unlocked. Returning to the menu reveals the availability for the battle game. This mode offers a choice among four characters, each equipped with their distinct set of weapons. Claire, another Claire featuring an alternate costume with unique items, Steve, Chris, and upon completing the battle game as Chris, Wesker becomes accessible. Although the stage layout remains constant, the end stage boss varies depending on the selected character. Nosferatu for Claire, Tyrant for her alternate costume, a giant worm for Steve, Type 2 Alexia for Chris, and Type 1 Alexia for Wesker. The stage comprises several rooms from the main storyline presented out of order, each inhabited by various enemies that must be defeated before progressing. Infinite ammo is provided, making enemy elimination relatively easy. However, to achieve a commendable rank, players must swiftly navigate through each room with optimal efficiency, aiming for an A rank. You might wonder about the significance of attaining an A rank. The incentive for achieving this rank in the battle game with every character is the linear launcher. The ultimate weapon exclusively available for use in this mode. Each character presents a distinct level of difficulty, with individual A rank time requirements. Claire's initial scenario is relatively easy, armed with the handgun, bowgun, and combat knife. Utilizing the explosive bolts with the bowgun allows a swift room clearance, and defeating Nosferatu becomes a breeze, earning an A rank if completed in under 6 minutes and 10 seconds. Opting for Claire's alternative costume raises the stakes, providing her with a grenade launcher loaded with various round types, excluding BOW rounds of course, an AK-47, and a combat knife. To achieve a fast time, it's recommended to forego the AK-47 and knife, focusing on the grenade launcher. Despite its slightly cumbersome reloading mechanism, strategically using different grenade rounds against specific enemy types proves effective. Standard grenade rounds in particular excel at clearing multiple zombies. The Tyrant poses a formidable challenge, mirroring the main story's difficulty, but with careful use of the standard grenade rounds, consistent sunlocking becomes achievable. Completing the stage in under 8 minutes secures an A rank for this alternative scenario. Playing as Steve makes for the easiest experience. Armed with the submachine guns, golden lugers, and combat knife, the unstoppable submachine guns allow for a straightforward power through strategy. Achieving an A rank merely requires completing the stage in under 10 minutes. Chris, on the other hand, offers a notably challenging gameplay. Equipped with the Magnum, Shotgun, and Combat Knife, the key is to focus solely on the Magnum, which can penetrate multiple enemies with a single shot. The catch is beating the stage within an unforgiving time limit of 6 minutes and 30 seconds, demanding relentless speed without any pauses. The Alexia Type 2 fight adds to the frustration, especially in her airborne phase. Without the linear launcher, the constant evasive maneuvers she employs makes hitting her a formidable task. Shooting upward in short burst becomes the primary strategy, all while dodging her fire attacks. Despite the difficulty, I managed to secure an A rank on this one. Wesker presents a formidable challenge. Armed solely with a combat knife and some healing items, the player must navigate through the entire stage relying solely on this melee weapon. The battle is ruthlessly demanding, and success may hinge on unpredictable factors due to some RNG elements. As the stage nears its end, within the lounge room accessible from this point here, Wesker encounters a slot machine, kicking the machine to open it. This may yield a Magnum with 6 rounds, or a diary titled D.I.J. Diary. Offering additional insights into the game's narrative from an unusual perspective, it's the rat. It's, it's the rat from Code Veronica. That rat. Yes, this rat. While the inclusion of a rat's viewpoint may seem peculiar to you, Capcom, most people just think it's stupid. Acquiring the Magnum becomes essential, as failing to do so results in Alexia instantly grabbing and killing Wesker. Once armed, dispatching of Alexia becomes relatively straightforward, requiring only a couple shots. Wesker's A rank time requirement is very merciful, demanding a completion within one hour, a more than ample time frame for players. The linear launcher, while undeniably cool, feels more like a novelty than a practical weapon. Personally, I found myself not really returning to use it after its unlock. There's only one reward for completing the main story of Code Veronica, and that is the infinite rocket launcher. Oh yeah, baby. <sighs> Fucking cringe. <laughs> Achieving this, however, is no small feat. You must secure an A rank by completing the game in under four and a half hours, with only one save allowed at the midpoint when Claire reaches the Antarctic. No retries are permitted, and even use of the first aid spray is restricted. You must also give Rodrigo the hemostatic medicine, and rescue Steve quickly to avoid a particular cutscene where Steve falls from the trap. That was too close. 
What took you so long? Oh, I need those. Give them to me. <sighs> Fine. But let's make a deal. I'll trade you for something fully automatic. I'll see you around, Claire. Adios. Hey, wait, Steve! Earning the A rank unlocks the Infinite Launcher, a powerful tool that lives up to its name. Despite the challenging requirements, the rocket launcher still stands as the best unlockable for a Resident Evil game. However, this marks the extent of the extra content for Code Veronica. Although Resident Evil Code Veronica garnered widespread acclaim upon its release, often hailed as one of the best installments in the series at the time, its commercial performance fell short of expectations. Critics lauded it as a must-have for the Sega Dreamcast, yet its sales figures were modest, reaching only 2.54 million units worldwide when accounting for both Dreamcast and PS2 versions. In contrast, Resident Evil 2 achieved immense success, with 6.1 million units sold across the PlayStation and Nintendo platforms. Notably, Code Veronica retained its status as one of the best-selling games on the Sega Dreamcast. A potential explanation for its underwhelming sales could be attributed to the delayed release on the PlayStation 2 in North America, six months after its debut on the Dreamcast. As we conclude Code Veronica, it stands as an exceptional experience. Highly recommended, it ranks among my favorite Resident Evil games. The unfolding narrative delving into the mystery of the Ashford family and intertwining the drama of the heroes with the story of these peculiar twins is captivating. Their connection to the Umbrella Corporation rooted in the T-Virus outbreak makes Code Veronica a pivotal chapter in the Resident Evil saga. While the battle games and unlockables may leave some wanting more, this game remains an underrated gem that deserves greater recognition. As rumors circulate about a possible remake, I can only say, I am ready. Code Veronica deserves justice, and with the right team, it can be revitalized in a respectful yet innovative way, preserving the essence of the original. Capcom, please don't miss the mark on this one. And that wraps up our journey in this video. Creating this video was a lot of fun, and I hope you found it enjoyable as well. While we delved into just one game this time, I had a lot to say about it. So if you liked this video, show your appreciation by hitting the like button. For those eager for more content in this series, consider subscribing to stay informed. Wishing you all a fantastic day, and until next time, take care.